they are consistently the most likely to unfriend, block and insult mm. people who hold different beliefs to their own. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall at The Spectator in London. Today I'm joined by Matt Goodwin, Professor of Politics at the University of Kent and author of four books including Sunday Times bestseller National Populism and his most recent book Values, Voice and Virtue, The New British Politics, which I finished this weekend and explores the change in politics from the onset of hyper globalization with Margaret Thatcher through to the populist revolts of the 20. Tens, and he spoke recently at the National Conservative Conference around the corner, the Emmanuel Centre. I did. Center. I'm sorry for ruining your weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, thank you for coming to speak with me. Uh, I no hope worries. I'd like to speak about your books and, yep. and um, NAF, the National Con- uh, Conservative Conference, which, as we speak now, is kind of, uh, I think we're maybe on the tail end of a big Twitter uh, flare up with some of, particularly, it seems to have aggravated the people that you describe as the cosmopolitans mm. in your uh, recent book. And, and um, I'm curious also to speak to you about the Conservative Party legacy and future, the Labour Party, where they are, and um, various things like immigration that, that yeah. tie in all of these things. But I thought perhaps before going into that, for people who haven't yet read the book, mm. if you might just lay out the your sort of uh, theory about traditionalists and cosmopolitans, yeah. Uh, and how those movements sort of underlie British politics. Yeah, sure. And I think, in in a sense, the con- the conference also speaks to that question and, and why the conference happened. Um, I, I wrote this book because I wanted to explain why Britain has been upended over the last decade by what I see as three interconnected but quite distinct rebellions. You had the rise of of populism, national populism with Nigel Farage, which obviously outflanked a lot of people. They didn't see it coming. You then had the vote for Brexit, again, outflanked much of the establishment. And then you had that post-Brexit realignment with Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in 2019, right? That seemed to usher in this new brand of conservative politics. And what I wanted to do in the book is really say, well, how on earth have we got here? Why on earth did, did all of that happen? And why are so many people frustrated and disillusioned with the state of the country? And, and one of the things that I personally felt very frustrated about was how we've been given many unconvincing narratives about why all of that happened. We've been told it's social media, we've been told it's Russia, it's you know individual donors, it's campaigners, it's what was written on the side of a big red bus. And in the book, really, what I say is actually, if you take a step back and look at Britain, in fact, if you look at most Western democracies, what I would argue is... Uh, these rebellions really reflect an understandable response to the rise of a new elite within our societies who are no longer reflecting the values that are held by millions of people, who are no longer giving those people a sufficient voice in the institutions, and who are now embracing a very divisive ideology of radical progressivism, which views some groups as having virtue, as having status, as having a sense of moral righteousness, but other groups as actually being seen as as inferior, as being seen as backward, as being seen as problematic in some way or other. And I think one of the key points about Britain today is that the, the new elite are united, unlike the old elite, by a set of liberal cosmopolitan views. And by that, I mean they're much more aggressively pro-immigration. They're much more supportive of returning Britain to the European Union. They're much more universalist in how they think about identity. So they're not really interested in Britain's distinctive identity, history and culture, which millions of people really do cherish. They want to keep Britain distinct. The new elite is really much more interested in reshaping our national identity around international themes like diversity or multiculturalism. And as as I said at the conference, you know, there's nothing wrong in saying that Britain is welcoming and diverse. But diversity cannot be the basis of our national identity because it's like saying we don't have an identity of our own. Mm -hmm. And many people out there clearly feel that we do have an identity that's worth preserving. So my message essentially is that unless we can somehow close these gaps, unless we can somehow get people to develop shared values or at least respect 
the fact that people hold different values and they're just as legitimate and just as acceptable as those that are in the corridors of power. And unless we can give people more of a voice in the national conversation, in the media, in the creative industries, in the cultural institutions, in the universities, in the schools, um, we're going to have bigger problems ahead, basically, is my conclusion. That what we've seen in the 2010s, you know, I think it's tempting to say, well, that's all over. Now we're back to normal. The adults are back in charge. I have a different view, actually. I think in a, in a way we, we could yet come to look at the 2010s as the beginning of a much more volatile period in British politics where people are trying to push back and trying to reassert who they are and what they believe in. Well, what, what sort of immediately jumped out to me is, is the idea that, the, um, that things are going in a certain direction, even or have come in a linear direction, as you've described it, even if they may go in a very different direction, as you suggest there. What I couldn't quite add up was that I think that the vo British voters are actually far more capricious. And um, if we, you know, of course, uh, Labour under Corbyn did very badly in 2019, but not so badly in 2017, which I don't think you address in the book. And now it looks like almost certainly the next government will be Keir Starmer's Labour, Labour Party. And so it seems to me that the idea that voters or the traditionalists that you describe are out of touch with the cosmopolitans who are who are, uh, have taken over the Labour Party doesn't quite add up because I think that the traditionists will end up voting for those cosmopolitans running the Labour Party at the next election. Well, some of them will. But I think if you look at where many people in Britain are today, I think going, going back to 2019 briefly is, is useful. Um, all political realignments are about demand and supply. So voters are demanding a certain response to some issues and parties are supplying that demand with a credible message and leader. And that's basically what Boris Johnson did. Uh, it's what Johnson and Farage did in a referendum. Partly, um, it's also what, what Blair did in, in the late 90s and the early 2000s. What's happened since 2019, however, is that the Conservative Party is no longer supplying that demand with a message that is capable of mobilizing many of those traditionalist voters. So what we've seen um, is many of those voters abandoning politics altogether. So to give you some, some, some evidence for that, when Johnson came in, this is a remarkable statistic, but the Conservatives had 76% of all Brexit voters. All 76%, three quarters were voting Conservative. When Liz Truss left office, that was down to about 35%. Mm. So the, the realignment that was around Brexit but was never just about Brexit, it was about traditionalism. It was about, let's leave the EU, let's lower migration, let's put Britain first, let's prioritize national, the national community, British workers. Um, that realignment had completely be, been blown apart. Now, some of those voters have gone to Labour, um, you know, partly because Keir Starmer's done quite a good job at sort of moving back to the centre. He's actually talked about accepting Brexit. He's talked about um, prioritising British jobs. He's done some an interesting announcement recently on housing and saying, actually, is it right that we have so many investors from outside of Britain um, exploiting and contributing to our housing crisis? So there's been a bit of a movement on the supply side for Labour. But the bigger issue in British politics today is we no longer have a political movement that is pitching loudly and credibly to the millions of voters who are basically saying, I want cultural security or cultural freedom from woke progressivism, mass immigration, hyper-globalization, but I also want economic security, right? I want this economy to be reshaped. I don't want it to just be dependent on, on London and financial services. I want it to be serving the wider community. And I think that what you saw both at the NatCon conference and what you saw through the realignment is really an expression of that desire for something different, for something much more in tune with where voters are. And just on 2017, because it is a really interesting point, you know, Jeremy Corbyn was actually, whatever your personal view of Corbyn, he was quite interesting for a number of reasons. One is he too reflected 
the utter disillusionment with the established parties. And we forget this. Mm -hmm. Corbyn was a populist. I mean, I would view Corbyn as a left populist. Mm -hmm. He was a populist. He he was some, somebody new. He was authentic. You might disagree with his beliefs, but he was authentic. And on the economy, on the on, on, on the economic axis of politics, he was actually where a lot of voters were. You know, he was saying, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks with the water companies, he was saying, look, don't trust these companies to serve the national interest. We should nationalize them. You can't trust these large companies to deliver on the national interest, and you can't trust banks and financial services to always reform capitalism. Now, I don't agree with his answers, but in raising those questions, he resonated actually with many of the same voters that I'm talking about, voters who have, to be blunt, have been left behind by the economic transformation of the country and are now looking at all of these cultural things that are happening and they're saying, you know, it's, I'm not even in this conversation anymore. You know, the, the people in Westminster are just kind of imposing this project top down. And that's so all realignments are about demand and supply. We've got lots of demand out there, but not much supply. You mentioned the, the cultural stuff, and, and this is something I want to get my head around. But do you really think that the cult, let's say the, the, the radical progressive cultural push, it really matters to voters as much as the housing crisis, various economic problems, cost of living, inflation? Do people give a damn about the trans issue, for example? Actually, when it comes to the voting, it's like, I, actually, at the moment, I can't really afford to live. So the first thing I would say is it's not either or, right? Voters will typically think about a cluster of issues. If you ask 2019 conservatives today, what are your top issues? You're absolutely right. Cost of living is number one. Immigration is number two. National health service is number three. Okay. So... Um, Voters tend to think about a cluster of issues. The second thing to say, though, is never fall into the trap of thinking that because issues are low salience, because they are down the list of priorities for voters, that they don't care about them. And I'll give you one example. Think about the sexualization of children and the politicization of children in our schools mm -hmm. and the um, creeping influence of radical progressivism. People say to me routinely, voters don't care about that. Well, look at America and look at Scotland. In America, that issue went from being a non-issue, fringe, marginal, nobody was talking about it, to becoming a top three national issue in about three years. Uh, it was galvanized by campaigns in Virginia, California, and the salience of that issue rocketed. And when it rocketed, people began to take notice of it. Mm -hmm. Europe, Brexit. I remember journalists lining up in the early 2010s and said, Matt, why on earth are you talking about EU membership all the time or immigration? You know, these are, EU membership is a low salience issue. But when people started talking about it mm. and debating it, it became one of the most important issues in the country. And the last one was Scotland. I remember everyone said, no one cares about culture wars. You know what happened when Nicola Sturgeon said, let's let 16 year olds legally change their gender? Voters started thinking, hang on, what are people talking about? They started looking at the question. I polled them. Only 20% of people said, I think this is a good idea. 80% looked at it and said, this is nuts. This is insane. Mm -hmm. I, we should not be allowing children to change their gender, even if you think people can change their gender, without any medical supervision and any support. Mm -hmm. And so salience changes. And how do you change salience? You have political entrepreneurs. You have people, leaders, who are brave enough courageous enough to turn things that I think many people care about into highly salient political issues. I personally don't think that is divisive culture war politics. My view would be women's rights, the rights of children, free speech, um, opposing political correctness, how we think about our history, how we think about our national identity. These are the foundations of civilization. They are not culture war questions. They are essential questions. And the fact that we talk about them as though they're cultural questions shows how much territory conservatives have um, ceded over the last 20 years. The, the, I probably would agree with you on a lot of those things, but I can't help but think that the Labour Party, which hasn't been as strong on a lot of those issues, in fact, are pretty weak on them, are still ahead in the polls despite them and and again I forgive me for hammering the point but they're still they're still ahead so you know despite Starmer not being able to say 100% of women don't have penises or whatever it was he couldn't say uh, they're still I mean I don't know if it's come down slightly but they still look on course to 
to win. Do you really think that these issues at the next general election in Britain, we, okay, which of them, if they can rise in, in salience, will, will, it, will be significant in the next election? Immigration, for sure. Um, it's the second issue for 2019 Conservatives, and it's about to become a much bigger issue in British politics as we see net migration rise from 504,000 last year to depending who you talk about in government. And I talk to a lot of people in the civil service who tell me this week, um, you know, mid-May 2023, uh, that we're looking at somewhere between 700,000 and a million, mm. which is remarkable given that it was 230,000 when David Cameron took office in 2010. Mm. Now, why is Labour ahead in the polls? Well, they're ahead in the polls because opposition parties don't win elections, governments lose them. There is no mass public enthusiasm for Keir Starmer, and there was very little public enthusiasm for Labour. This isn't 1997, when all we were talking about was public services and education. This is an electorate that is incredibly weary, angry, frustrated, mm -hmm. and is basically saying, the country is in such a state, let's let the other guys have a go. Mm -hmm. If you ask them about these key issues, who can solve the immigration question is one example. The most popular answer is not Labour. It's none of them. There's a massive reservoir of disillusionment over that question. If you ask voters, um, who do you think can solve crime? Massive amount of disillusionment. Nobody thinks left and right have the answers. And because we're in a majoritarian system, there, there are no alternatives. Now, if we're in PR, if we had a proportional representation system, uh, we'd have other parties that would be much more visible. But because voters are pushed into one of the two, you know, they have to ultimate, ultimately make a choice. And, and this is where I still think, genuinely, I'm happy for people obviously to disagree with me. I think there is so much space right now for something different in British politics that really said to both left and right, you've fundamentally failed over the last 30 years. You failed for economic reasons, you failed for cultural reasons. Um, you're increasingly failing with regard to this transformation of our culture, which I think is the most un-British thing that has been happening. I mean, the point about woke or political correctness is not that it's a number one issue in the country, it's that it is increasingly pervading everything. So um, I'll give you an example. I did a, a project recently. I said to, to conservative voters, what are the top issues that you care the most about, but which you feel you are not represented on? Okay. The top three, political correctness has gone too far. And as I say to politicians in Britain, don't say woke, say political correctness. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what that is. Only about 45% of people know what woke is. Political correctness has gone too far. Immigration is uh, out of control. And we need to do more to protect Britain's distinctive identity, culture, and history. Those are the three issues that, that conservatives care the most about and feel that they're not represented on. You might also throw crime into that mix. So that raises an intriguing question. What if we actually had a conservative uh, leader of the Conservative Party? What if we actually had somebody who came out tomorrow and said, you know what? I don't want to have an economy built around importing cheap migrant labor for the next 20 years. I don't want to have a country that can't solve the housing crisis while running net migration at 500,000. And I don't want a country that is still falling over itself to invest in London and the graduate class while ignoring everybody else. Mm. And I don't want a country that is increasingly exposing our children to an experiment that has no basis in science. Mm -hmm. That person would be very popular. That person would lose SW1 and London in two days. Mm -hmm. But out there in the wider country, they would be incredibly popular because they would be saying what everybody is basically thinking, mm -hmm. which is that this experiment, this liberal revolution isn't working. In practical, or, uh, but rather on the party political side, in what do you think the Tories in government can do on the issue of immigration? What policy now, what what could they do to convince voters that they, or they're the ones who can actually deal with it if it's, as you say, the salient, one of the salient issues, or do you think it's it's too late? I don't think the Conservatives can fix the pro can fix the issue, can fix the problem, and I do think it's a problem. For me, immigration has always been about the political economy, right? It's not about the people. It's, it's the fact that we as a country have now become dependent on a model that is basically driven by cheap workers and consumption. Right? And then we sit here and say, well, why is productivity so low? Why are growth rates so low? Um, and why are so many people feeling as though they have no real control and influence over the decisions that are affecting their daily lives? 
after Brexit, the Conservatives through Boris Johnson made a very, they took a conscious decision um, to liberalise non-European migration. Not many people realised what they were doing at the time, but they basically said, look, we're going to repivot, reposition, and we're going to open the door to record numbers of people from outside of Europe, Nigerians, Zimbabweans, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're also going to do is we're going to say to everybody that this is a high skill immigration policy. We're attracting the best of the best. And then we're going to reduce the salary thresholds for worker visas to 21,000 pounds or 25,000 pounds in, in most sectors. The average wage in this country is about 33,000. So you're looking at it and you're thinking, well, we're being told we've got a high skill immigration policy. We're being told that the British people have got control, but we've got a visa program here with salary thresholds, which are about 10 grand below the average wage. And also Boris Johnson removed the requirement for British companies to advertise jobs in Britain first. Now that to me does not seem like it was a reasonable, satisfactory response to the Brexit vote. And the worst bit about all of this is, is they then let, let open the floodgates on international students and their relatives. Why does that matter? Well, I work in universities, so I'll tell you. The whole point of Brexit for many people was to get off this economy that is producing too many graduates when there aren't enough graduate jobs. About a third of graduates aren't working in graduate jobs because there are too many graduates. We need fewer universities and we need to get more kids doing trades you're going to technical co colleges, becoming doctors, by the way, because we don't allow enough of them to become doctors or to become medical professionals. And uh, what the government's done is said, no, actually, we're going to keep this broken model going by allowing even more international students into the country in order to keep broken universities afloat, uh, which therefore removes any incentive for universities to invest in you know, building relationships with community colleges and, and helping apprentices and all the rest of it. And so on all the tough decisions that, that the Conservatives should have taken, all the difficult choices, they went for the easy option. So they can't solve the migration question. They don't want to solve the migration question. And that's why they're fixated on small boats. And they might be able to slow down the numbers if they get the Rwanda policy working. They might be able, if they're brave enough, to do some things like reforming the Human Rights Act or possibly leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. But I would bet, make a bet with you, Winston, that a year from now, we'll be looking at net migration at somewhere around close to a million. We'll probably have had another 70, 80,000 people crossing uh, the channel in the boats. And the politics of immigration, which can often be very divisive and very ugly, and which we really should have put to bed after the Brexit referendum, that they will be back with a bang. I try to understand why the Tories have, have allowed this, and, uh, this immigration to just skyrocket like it has. Is it because they're trying to deal with the for, uh, population growth decline? The underlying logic for the Conservative Party, I think, is twofold. One is... And this is what I said at the conference, which is, I think, ruffles some feathers in the Conservative Party, is they've consistently put business before the national community. And that's the reality of the Conservative Party. In the aftermath of Brexit, they, they face a choice, right? They could have stood up to business and said, we're not going to keep just funneling cheap migrant labour to you to keep your costs down, to keep profits up and to stop you from investing in British people and developing British skills and innovating and automating and the rest of it. They didn't, they failed. They just said the first real test, they fell over and said, nope, we're gonna, okay, right, sorry. Um, you know, Simon Wolfson and Next and big business, sorry. Okay, you can't get workers, we're gonna keep workers coming. Sorry, we'll keep the taps on. Um, so that's that was the first part of the logic. And the second is, to be frank, most Tories are status conscious Tories. They don't really like to get drawn into cultural disputes over you know, immigration and identity, it's very difficult for them. They don't want to get drawn into the woke stuff as we saw in response to the NatCon conference because they think, oh no, this is it's beneath us when we don't do this. This is culture war stuff, which is why today's conservatives are actually very different from an early generation of conservatives who were basically aware of the fact that they are custodians of the nation. They're not just here to serve business. They're not just here to drive the economy, that's a massively important part of what they're doing, but they're also here to defend institutions, to pass on a cultural inheritance and to look after families. And I think at every turn since Brexit, the Conservatives have shown that actually uh, 
they're not really all that interested in doing those things. They view those things as quite cranky, as, as quite fringe. And um, one of the fascinating comparisons to make today is between Britain and Sweden. So why is it the British Conservatives lowered the salary thresholds and basically kept us dependent on low skill migration, whereas the Swedish Conservatives have just said, we are not going to have low salary thresholds. We're going to keep them at least at the average wage, if not higher, because if people are coming in, then we want them to be high skilled and we want them to be contributing to the economy. We've not done that. We've done the opposite. And here's something that would, you know, is obviously going to ruffle some feathers and is a bit of a controversial point to make, but I'll make it. A lot of the people who are now coming in under the post-Brexit liberalisation are not going to be contributing anywhere near as much to the national economy as the people who were coming in before. And there are a number of studies now that have shown that low-skill migrants coming from other parts of the world are going to contribute less to the British economy than, let's say, the French and the Spanish and the Greeks and the Latvians and so on. And this is reflected in our housing system. 60% of social housing in London is going to people who aren't British. And we've got this housing crisis, yet we've got you know, depending on what estimate you use, a couple of hundred thousand homes sitting in offshore tax havens for foreign investors. So this is where the politics of immigration is going. It's going to increasingly be linked to housing. It's going to increasingly be linked to public services, which is why I keep saying to the Conservatives, if you don't get on top of this, if you don't get on top of this, you are leaving yourselves wide open to a major challenge, a kind of reconfiguration of the right, which is what the conference this week in Westminster was about the National Conservatism Conference, where there are now serious people. You know, this isn't a fringe thing. Serious cabinet ministers, serious MPs, serious donors, thinkers who are just saying, you know what, this brand of conservative politics has has run into a cul-de-sac. It doesn't have the answers to today's problems. The, I mean, I'd go further. It's been a complete and utter disaster. They've had power for thirteen years cost of living crisis, migrant crisis, as you described. Uh, Douglas Murray, in his speech at the NatCon conference, articulated very well. How can you expect young people to want to uh, play the capitalist game or, or uh, be capitalists if they're unable to accumulate capital because of the housing crisis? There's ob the obvious implication there. This has all happened under the watch of, of the Conservative Party. Over, uh, is it 50, something like 53% of fa uh, households now take more we from welfare than they put in. Top 10% of the country uh, pay for over half of income tax. It's a welfare state. This has all happened under the Tories. The, they, 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 the only thing I can see that the Tories have achieved in the last 13 years is Brexit. Uh, there's nothing leveling up has been leveling down it's, uh, and I, I don't it's it's completely their fault as you said earlier in the, in, the, in this conversation it's they they they're losing this well i speaking to you in the spectator so i don't need to tell you you this as you know the spectators led the debate on this but if you just look at what's happened to welfare over the last decade you know the irony was that david i remember david cameron and george osborne you know really going after labor in terms of how many people they essentially encouraged to become reliant on the welfare state, losing dignity, meaning and purpose in their lives. But as we're sat here today, there's close to 5 million people on working age, mm. uh, working age people on benefits. Um, what we've done is we've sort of agreed not to talk about that and fill the holes with with migrant labour. So it's it's a very difficult one and it's also one that is going to become increasingly visible to everybody over the next 10 20 years because the other part of the logic for the conservative party and they're right to worry about it but they're wrong to berate national conservatives for talking about it which is we have a massive demographic crisis looming in this country you know we are 2020 25 i think you know is going to be one of the the last years where but essentially more people are going to be, more Brits are going to be dying than being born. And the fertility rate now is already down to about 1.5. So you're basically looking at a welfare state, an economy that over the next 50 years, unless you have large amounts of inward migration or controversial, you encourage British families to have more children, maybe by having a pro-family tax policy, maybe by having pro-family norms throughout society, maybe actually having a conversation about how we might encourage people to do that. Um, we're going to have to have lots and lots and lots of more, more immigration. And um, that 
already immigration is the biggest driver of population growth in this country. Um, so over the next 10, 20 years, uh, the country will become visibly very, very different. I mean, by, 20, by 2060, if you look at the estimates from Oxford, um, and I just say this to 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 give you a sense of the pace of change, not because I think it's necessarily problematic, but to give you a sense of the change. So by 2060, it's estimated that the percentage of white British citizens will go from around about 80% to about 60%, and by which means that in most primary schools by the 2050s or thereabouts, essentially white British kids will be will be a minority. Um, and so the pace of change is going to be enormous. So what we've seen over the last 20 years is really nothing compared to what we're going to see over the next 20. We're going to add about another 5 million people to the population by 2040, which is like five Birminghams. Mm. Um, so the population change will be enormous. And our capacity for dealing with that, with infrastructure, health, um, housing, is going to be tested like never before. So we either come up with a generation of leaders who are realistic about how much migration we can deal with given those challenges, or we try and push forward new people who can at least begin to address some of those problems and raise the conversations about those problems. I mean, the, the response to NatCon to the conference was fascinating in that somebody, so the FT or the New Statesman or somebody said, um, oh, they're talking about demography and birth rates as if this is like a taboo. I mean, the problem I have with this country is we're not a serious country when we talk about social and cultural problems. Much of the world is talking about the demographic time bomb. Much of the world is talking about aging societies. Much of the world is talking about how to develop pro-family policies. But in Britain, where our national conversation is dominated by social liberals and progressives who will basically use this to try and stain people as being, you know, right wing or Victor Orban sympathizers or whatever, we, we're just not a serious country. We're not even capable of having the policy debates that we need to have in order to solve these problems. That was actually quite, the two speeches at the NatCon that come to mind were Louise Perry's and Ed West, who were- oh, They were my favorite speeches. Yeah, they were prepared <laughs> to talk about that specific thing. And I, I really challenge any anyone who considers himself different political opinion to, to disagree with the fundamentals of what they were saying, particularly Louise Perry's argument about supporting mothers. I mean, just forget forget about all like the, what it means for the identity change of the nation. Just don't we want to support women? Don't we want to support mothers? It seems like that it's, it was so refreshing actually to hear that that, that being sp spoken about. Like it's, it, it's how that's been neglected from British politics is, is shameful. Well, it's actually how the family has been neglected. Family, I mean, yeah. if you look at, you know, we have the highest rates of family breakdown in, in the Western world, some of the highest. We're on, on course to have some of, by the end of this decade, the largest number of single parent families in Europe. We already have a 43% of kids in this country by the time they turn 18 are no longer living with mum and dad. Um, so we have a we have an enormous family problem. And, and the reaction, by the way, to some of the speeches at NatCon online was saying, well, what's the problem with single mothers. Look, I, I was raised by a single mother and I said in my speech, you know, my parents divorced when I was five. So the idea that talking about family breakdown is reactionary, is divisive, is problematic. The people who say that have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Because if, if you look at the evidence on family breakdown, and if you want the evidence, go online, Google family inequalities, Nuffield, you can get the report, came out at the end of last year. It is completely comprehensive, and it tells a very consistent picture. Kids who come from broken homes are more likely to um, do worse in the education system, more likely to be arrested, more likely to pass through um, uh, uh, prisons and the, the criminal justice system, more likely to be depressed, more likely to have mental health problems, um, off the charts and a lot of these things. And by the way, there is actually a significant difference between kids who are raised in a, in a cohabiting couple um, uh, from kids who are raised in a married couple. There is actually a difference between those two. And I know this is difficult for people to talk about, but it's true. And, and this is not to take anything away from single mothers. I would, I, I'm able to say my single mother is one of the strongest, most impressive people I've ever met in my life. But I would still rather have been raised in a two-parent family. If you look at the evidence, it's overwhelming. I would, would have done better. I would have been more stable, et cetera, et cetera. So 
we, we need to be able to have these conversations and we need to be able to have them in a way that is reasonable, evidence-led and say, okay, so what could we do? Well, we could change the way in which we tax uh, families. We could tax them as families, not as individuals. We could um, change the way we distribute childcare. We could push back against Jeremy Hunt, who clearly views mothers and fathers as economic units who need to leave the home as quickly as possible and get back to work. Uh, you know, when all the evidence shows that actually children should really be with their mothers for as long as possible during the first uh, three years, if not longer. And we need to be able to have these arguments and take these arguments to the mainstream parties. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see any of the people who are doing that with the exception of, you know, Miriam Cates, Danny Kruger, and some of the people at the conference who are actually willing to say, we need to be able to talk about the politics of family. Families are not just kind of fluid entities that are defined by anything and everything. We know what a good, stable, productive, successful family structure looks like. And if you even disagree with all of that, and you're a ruthless pragmatist, then just perhaps ponder the fact that having strong families is the greatest return on investment that any society can make. I mean, think of the financial savings and the impact on GDP by having strong, cohesive family units in society. I mean, if you want the rational case for, you know, the economic instrumental case for families, it's there, mm -hmm. right? But if you want the moral case, as in actually this is why we should really be talking about it, that's there too. So why don't we, why don't we actually have a serious discussion about it? Absolutely. Before we go into the, the, the NatCon conference, or we've, mm. we've already gone into it a little bit, <laughs> some listeners will find both the words national, nationalist and conservative as kind of, they'll have allergic reactions to the words immediately. So before we go into what Don't happened, use the National Health Service. <laughs> um, what, um, can you give your, okay, I mean, like nationalism is conflated with jingoism, the Holocaust, uh, the, the sins of, of, of the 20th century, a lot, a lot of them. What, can you make a, the case for nationalism detached from those things, or, or is it under, are they right to, to say that uh, it's, it's attached to those sort of uh, sins? Yeah, one of my favorite speeches, I mean, all of them obviously are online uh, on YouTube. Uh, one of my favorite speeches was by Timothy Stanley, the Telegraph uh, uh, columnist, writer. And uh, he was asked this question by a, a prominent journalist, Ian Dale, who said, oh, well, the problem with this movement is it's called itself national conservatism. And Tim, Tim said, well, what's the problem with that? He said, well, national socialism. At which point Tim said, well, maybe we should have a word with the National Trust and the National Health Service or the NSPCC. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre state of affairs where we're not even able to talk about the nation state. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we've, we've got into. And that it's in itself- It's nation statism. That's, is, that in yeah. itself reflects the power of new, the new elite, the social liberals and radical progressives in the institutions that certain things are considered taboo. I don't know of many countries outside of Western Europe that would come close to thinking like that, yet, yet we do. National conservatism, in my mind, is a, is a very distinctive political movement which wants to put the interests of the national community first, which wants to prioritize communities over individuals, and which wants to ensure that families um, and um, communities and neighborhoods are uh, promoted and protected uh, from global, uh, global uh, globalization and global interests. And that's why national conservatives are supportive of, very supportive of lowering um, immigration. They're instinctively skeptical of large-scale global corporations and business. Um, they want to celebrate the distinctiveness of national identity. They don't just want Britishness or Englishness to be reshaped as a celebration of international diversity and multiculturalism. Um, they're very welcoming of people who are genuinely in need of help, but they're very suspicious and skeptical of people who are seen to abuse the system. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the view of most national conservatives is if you are not embracing British values and respecting British institutions, then you should consider, um, you know, not living in Britain. I mean, that I think is a fair response. And that's why they've been willing to talk about things that, that many other people haven't been willing to talk about. They've talked about the, 
sexual exploitation of children through the grooming scandal. They've talked about what's happening in schools where children are being taught there are 72 genders. Um, they're, they're willing to talk about the demographic time bomb, but they're also willing to talk about industrial strategy, how to build an economy that isn't dependent on London, how to drive growth in a serious way that isn't just based around consumption and flooding the market with workers from overseas. They're willing to say, you know, actually, I don't think we should just import doctors and nurses. I think we should expand the number of medical places for British kids so that they can actually become doctors and nurses and go into the healthcare system. And they're willing to say, Tony Blair was wrong. Uh, we shouldn't just have a nation full of university degree holders. We should have, uh, you know, a true one nation. You know, we should have uh, apprentices and te technical colleges and vocational education producing alternative routes into leading a successful life. And one of the most interesting ideas I heard at NatCon was, well, you know, if you want to discuss reforming the House of Lords, here's an idea. Why don't we have a, a, a people's chamber that reflects the different, um, the different uh, trades and the different skills and the different communities that we have in this country. There's one way of reforming the House of Lords in an interesting way that would send a message that we value work. We, we see dignity in work. We see meaning in work. Um, and I think there are just many things that we, we could do in this country that, that send a very loud signal that the social and economic settlement has changed. You know, and, and, and the, I'm not, in the book, obviously, I'm quite critical of Margaret Thatcher. I, I never say, you know, I, I, many of the things Margaret Thatcher did were necessary at the time, but they were, it, it was a set of answers to a different set of questions. Mm -hmm. And, and I, w w what worries me about the Conservatives today is that they still think they're living in 1988 and they're still providing answers, but, but to the, you know, the wrong answers to, to an old set of questions. And they haven't quite got the right answers to the new questions. Well, on that, you, you criticised in your speech at NatCon the ultra free traders, I think mm. was your term. Although although you didn't expand on that. And I, I would be curious what you meant by ultra free traders. Yeah, so when you go to the 19, go back to the 1990s and the early 2000s, the whole debate about globalization led by you know, Tony Blair, Larry Sumners, among others, uh, um, uh, lots of folks in the European Union was that Globalization, the deregulation of economies, liberalizing finance, um, increasing free trade, global trade would, would lift all boats in society. It was a good thing, symbolized by Blair's speech in 2005, where he famously said, if you don't support globalization, if you're not on board, you basically don't understand the world, right? And he essentially said, you know, you're, you're an idiot if you don't get this. Um, what we now know through the work of, of David Orter, David Dawn, among others in, in economics, is that the, the, the deregulation and liberalization of finance and um, the opening up of national economies to, to global free trade um, had disproportionately negative effects on working class voters in Western economies, um, especially non-graduate workers in industrial communities that were hit hard by the economic shocks of growing trade with China and in Britain, in part trade with places, other places in Europe. And uh, that did two things. One is it significantly lowered uh, wages um, and, uh, and, and, and the economic interests of, work, of those workers. But crucially, secondly, there are a, number of, a number of papers now that show it also undermined family stability and undermined the social fabric, so the community fabric, that where you had areas that were suddenly exposed to these big shocks or that suddenly had a really big influx of, of cheap migrant workers from Central Eastern Europe as part of this, this project, it wasn't just that domestic workers lost money, it was that there, there were higher rates of family breakdown, higher rates of so-called drugs of despair, people turning to cocaine, heroin, alcohol, so-called slow motion suicides, and communities became weaker in many of those areas. And what always irritates me about British Tories and conservatives and free traders, by that I mean economic liberals who, who believe passionately that actually we, we need to do more of that. We need to deregulate. Which would include Rhys Mogg, who made a speech. Yeah, as partly Rhys Mogg, you know, but we need to basically deregulate, you know, take caps off bankers' bonuses, prioritise the city. What makes me nervous about that is I've never yet heard any of them tell me their view about that evidence, which shows that it not only undermines the domestic uh, 
not only undermines domestic workers, but damages the fabric of families and communities. So I think there has to be an alternative model that is that is much more focused at doing what that first, not first wave of globalization, but what that 90s wave of globalization, 2000s wave didn't do. And it didn't think seriously about how to compensate or prepare the losers of globalization for what was coming. Everybody just said, get on with it. Mm. It will be fine. Boats will be lifted. And we now know that it wasn't fine. And that's why support for Brexit was strongest in those communities. Mm. It's why support for Farage was strongest in those communities. It's why many of those voters in the Red Wall and elsewhere said, you know what, actually, I can sense, I think, I think Boris Johnson is talking about a different brand of politics from Margaret Thatcher. It mm. sounds like this leveling up thing, this kind of Brexit thing, this kind of lowering immigration thing. To me, it sounds like that's quite different yeah. from Thatcher and everything. Now, of course, we now know it wasn't really all that different at all. Um, but many of those voters, I think, had been shaped by that experience. Um, mm. And that's what I mean, that I think the free traders don't really reflect enough on the the problems and the failures of, of of that project in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Do you consider yourself more of a protectionist? Not necessarily a protectionist, but I think certainly somebody that's instinctively skeptical of globalization. Mm -hmm. I am very skeptical of globalization because I think I've seen too many cases where large corporates have basically sold lo local people down the river. You know, uh, corporates are uh, fundamentally self-interested entities, which I, you know, it's, it, sometimes that is incredibly helpful and it works and it drives economies, mm. but they are not very good at, at, at really acknowledging and, 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 and responding to the importance of community and, and tradition and cohesion. And, you know, you could see that in large parts of the Red Wall under, you know, New Labour um, and uh, where you would see the, the story I remember most vividly was um, a sports direct factory that was set up on the site of an old of an old mine and the old mine used to keep that community going and it, you know not to romanticize it but it also gave people a powerful sense of belonging and the, the when the sports direct factory opened i think there were 13,000 jobs somewhere around that and um the the owner um uh, of the company bust in essentially cheap migrant workers who work for less and who took the bulk of those jobs and that to me is not a responsible, productive capitalism. That's a predatory capitalism. Mm. And, and that's, that's the stuff that makes me instinctively nervous and anxious about the Conservative Party's embrace of some of that. And it was also underlined by Liz Truss. I think her, I thought, I found it very revealing that one of her first political moves was to lift the cap on bankers' bonuses and then to start negotiating a trade deal with India that would have essentially had pretty relaxed free movement. And I just don't understand, at the time, I didn't really understand how prioritising the city and more migration was a suitable response to the politics of Brexit. I think it would have made much more sense to say, we've promised people a serious levelling up strategy. Yep. We've promised people a, a one nation economy. All of our mid-level cities in Britain routinely underperform their counterparts across much of Europe. I mean, outside of London, I mean, all of our mid-level cities really are nowhere near as dynamic as and as innovative as they should be. And I just never really saw the Conservatives embrace that and come up with some interesting ideas for dealing with that. What we did see was Southeastern Conservative MPs complaining that too much money in investment or even talking about areas north of the M25 was somehow unconservative or problematic. Mm. And that, to me, reflected the roots of the Conservative Party, but also just reflected the kind of general disinterest that you often find in London with areas that are outside of the country. So I, I am instinctively sceptical of, mm -hmm. of the Conservatives on, on the economy, which, by the way, makes me an average voter. Because if you look at an so average it voter... It sounds quite similar to Blue Labour, a lot of what you've just... Well, yeah, but if you look at the average voter too, they are a little bit more to the economic left and a little bit, well, quite a way to the cultural right than most of the people who sit in the House of Commons. And that basically is the tension mm -hmm. running through all of this. You know, so it's almost as though, I mean, you know, he won't, but if Keir Starmer came out tomorrow and said, you know, look, actually, I think we should probably nationalise water companies. I think we should probably, um, you know, lower corporation tax or give companies big tax incentives to invest in non-London areas of the economy. 
and we should have an immigration cap and increase the salary thresholds, he would alienate some radical progressives, but boy, would it be popular everywhere, everywhere else. Mm, mm. You know, he'd be, I mean, whether he's got the charisma to pull that off, whether, I mean, he certainly doesn't have the courage, but I think it would be an interesting experiment. And that's where the action is. I mean, if you look at, you know, look at France, you look at Italy, you look at Sweden, you look at America, you know, look at what Biden's done on a lot of issues, you know, big infrastructure and uh, industrial policy. We just seem to be way behind the curve on a lot of this because I, it just feels to me over the last three, four years, we've just become a very anti-intellectual country. We've become quite inward looking. We haven't really engaged fully with the way in which political movements elsewhere are evolving. Um, and I think that's why the British Tories look very weak and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So uh, back to the, the NatCon uh, conference, some of the pushback that's, that's been online seems to have tied in a little bit with your book, the, the, the sort of cosmopolitan uh, uh, disdain for uh, ideas that would be popular amongst working normal people. Uh, uh, particularly thinking of em Emily Maitlis describing, <laughs> sort of lumping everyone together as conspiracy yeah. theorists, anti-vaxxers, <laughs> um, anti, she's used the term anti-migrant rather an, than anti-immigration or anti-immigrant rather than anti-immigration, which is an interesting yeah. distinction that she's made there. But uh, all in all, not engaging yeah. properly with the, the discussions that are being had. Um, what do you think, why do you think this is so, has been so controversial? Well, I think partly um, it reflects the power of the new elite in the national conversation. Uh, I think Emily Maitlis, John Sopel and Lewis Goodall are, you know, real examples, great examples of who I call the new elite. I think there is a, there is a, um, there are a group of journalists and commentators who essentially view anything outside of the liberal consensus, which is shared by about 20% of the country. If you look at the British Social Attitude Survey, about 20% of Brits are are sort of strongly and consistently liberal on a whole suite of issues. Mm. If you step outside of that by talking about things like lowering immigration, seeing the best in Britain, objecting to the portrayal of our society as, as racist, as talking about the importance of family, talking about the importance of clamping down on crime, saying we should talk about why so many young children were sexually exploited by grooming gangs. And we do want to ask why so many journalists refuse to go near it. They just can't handle that. It's outside of this very narrow Overton window that they've constructed. And that's why, by the way, you see the media landscape fragmenting rapidly. Um, since the Brexit referendum, BBC Radio 4 today has lost 1.7 million weekly listeners. Wow. Why do we have um, out, 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 outputs like this, new podcasts? Why do we have GB News, Talk TV? Why do we have Unheard? Why do we have um, you know, Spiked? Why do we have this flourishing ecosystem um, full of people who I think all sense that the legacy institutions dominated typically by elite graduates who come from professional managerial families, who tend to share the same sets of radically progressive, socially liberal values, and who tend to basically deride everybody else's racist bigots and idiots who don't understand the complexity of the modern world. Um, I think those people are now saying, look, we need to have a different kind of national conversation in this country. And I, I personally find it quite refreshing that the moment, you know, very senior journalists like Emily Maitlis and John Sopel leave the BBC and they really tell us what they think. It's like, oh yeah, okay. I, I kind of thought that, <laughs> that was the case all along. And now I know, now I know. And, um, and this is reflected in the evidence that I talk about in the book. I mean, 90% of our journalists now belong to the graduate class. Half of them went to one of two universities. Um, local media has collapsed, regional media has collapsed. They go straight from the universities into the media newsroom where they're basically surrounded by people who look like them, come from the same backgrounds. Um, and I sit in focus groups with voters all the time. And so many people sit at home watching the adverts on TV, watching the media debates, watching the discussions, and just asking themselves, where is this country? I mean, seriously, if you live in Boston and Skegness, or if you live in Northampton or you live in Clacton or you live in um, South Wales and you watch the adverts on British TV, 
and you actually look at the the, the way in which this, this country is portrayed along you know very socially liberal, radically progressive lines. Um, I think a lot of people are just wondering what's happened to the creative class, what's happened to the cultural institutions, and I don't think this is a this isn't a conspiracy. I mean, it's it's simply that. The institutions are dominated by elite graduates. Graduates have moved left on cultural questions and they've taken the institutions with them. This is what in the US they call the Great Awakening, that as white graduate liberals have basically radicalized over the last 10 years in response to Donald Trump, in response to Brexit, in response to all of these things that have shocked their system. And I understand that. I mean, I, I think many leavers felt the same way about Blair or felt the same way about Cameron. Um, but as they've been shocked by these things, they've moved leftwards culturally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so now we're at a point where they're not even capable of actually having a conversation about these issues. I don't think I've ever seen anybody on Alistair Campbell's show, James O'Brien's show, the Emily Maitlis show that directly and openly challenges their worldview. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look at the evidence on um, elite graduates or uh, social liberals, they are consistently the most likely to unfriend, block, um, and insult mm. people who hold different beliefs to their own. They're the most likely to say they would feel uncomfortable if one of their kids married somebody who voted for Brexit or somebody who, ha who held gender critical views. So the idea that we have a kind of uh, liberal, enlightened, uh, tolerant, open um, uh, elite class, I'm afraid I don't see it. I just don't see it. I see a group that is basically trying to shut down or stigmatize people who want to challenge the consensus. And, and that to me is not liberal at all. Mm. Uh, and I think voters have picked up on that. That's why 60% now say, I can't say what I really want to say in this country because I feel as though political correctness has, has become too too stifling. Do you think then the British, oh, sorry, the national conservative movement is one of the movements or the movement to come and fill the void that they're leaving politically? Do you think, I think it's one of the movements that could? I think on both the right and the left, you're seeing you're seeing the rise of people who are trying to have a different conversation, right? And I talk to everybody, left, right, whatever, and I think you can see on the left, there are you know, podcasts and YouTube channels and so on that are trying to have a different conversation about the country. And I think on the right, you can see that too. I think the reaction to the National Conservative Conference has been revealing and that it got so much reaction. I think that shows that people grasp that actually there is an argument that there that is going to cut through and resonate with much of the rest of the country. And I think the fact that much of that coverage was instinctively hostile, was openly hostile, um, shows again um, how people are trying to control the national conversation in a way that, that, that upholds the existing consensus. I mean, Michael Lind wrote a wonderful book recently called The New Class War, uh, in which he says that um, you know, one of the problems with the managerial professional overclass today is that they will basically denigrate everybody who disagrees with them as, you know, racist, transphobe, lunatic, fringe, cranky, partly to ensure and to try and um, prevent any serious opposition to the project from, from emerging. Mm. And uh, there are, look, I mean, there are racists in our society and there are transphobes, but most of the people who are asking themselves why this economy isn't working and why this society isn't working, I don't think are particularly bad people. Mm. Um, but I think they've twigged that actually our political conversation isn't reflecting their values and voice. Matt, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of this country? I'm I'm very uh, I'm I'm very pessimistic um, because I um, I'm increasingly uh, of the view that left and right don't represent much of the country anymore. I think the the big winner at the next election will be apathy. I think lots of people would just not participate, and um, I think the pace of change that is going to be sweeping through Britain over the next twenty thirty years. And the, the lack of long-term planning for that and the, the lack of long-term um, policy work that is needed to get Britain ready for that and to address the challenges that we've got, um, 
leaves me very pessimistic about where we're going to be in in the years ahead because even my students you know my zuma students uh, from gen z were born in uh, 2004 my first years um they're very gloomy about the direction of the country because they say how can we get a house mm. how can we get into this labor market uh how can we you know thrive and prosper um you know we're not we're not only competing with with previous generations who had things much easier but we're also now competing with you know, rising numbers of, of people from overseas, um, you know, who often have more more support than they do. So I think we're going to uh, we're going to have some real challenges over the next 20, 30, 40 years. So I'm I'm pessimistic. I'm not not at the point where I've given up, but I'm 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 gloomy. And that's why I think we need to work at reforming and reshaping the institutions to ensure that they get a wider pool of talent in them and they give more of a voice to people who come from different parts of our country and voice is really, really important. That's partly what Brexit was about, it's partly what 2019 was about, and it's why so many people are turning up at these strange but very busy conferences in Westminster on a Monday and a Tuesday, you know, in the middle of May, that I think that people are sensing that actually we're gonna need something else to meet those challenges. Well, on this, that's a slightly more positive note than the, it is. The, the, the pessimism, but I always even hope that your pessimism might encourage people convinced by your arguments to actually they should be engaging and being part of the change thank you matt thank you for your time thanks for having me